Ha, this is Dr. Puppy. First, my sincere apologies regarding spilling the beans about Sono Sweeney and Sono Norway. Matt, Mike, Dr. Puppy will make it up to you next time you're in my puppyhood. It'll be just like 97. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Problem is, sometimes I get excited when rapping about appendicitis. Makes my puppet parts tangle. But for real, dawg, you had to be crazy to miss this. Personally, I hate massage, relaxation, good food, cruises, and world-class education. So count me out. But let's be real. I'm a puppet. Who's going to let me ultrasound him? And I look weird in a robe. Anyway, enjoy this from the Abdo Master, Jesper, and yes, Chris Murr does have the hairiest belly in the world. Jeez, dog, get a razor. Dr. Puppet, ow. If you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasounds some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs. Let us know how you feel about it. Uh, he's slightly intoxicated. You know, got his wrist pain by, by doing over-aggressive high fives to his buddies. <laughs> you know, uh, we've talked about this before. I want to talk about some of the newer literature. Well, not just the newer literature, but maybe some literature that we didn't talk about last time. We, we, we talked about acute appendicitis. I think this all started in the 90s when we started CTing everybody for acute appendicitis. And it turns out there was a paper in 1998 in the New England Journal of Medicine that came to the conclusion that routine appendiceal CT performed in patients who present with suspected appendicitis improves patient care, reduces the use of hospital resources. That is a huge freaking statement. And it's probably true. I mean, if you think about it, if you CT people, instead of actually uh, just taking suspected uh, patients on physical exam to the operating room, you're probably going to decrease hospital resources. Well, kind of true if you're not bringing ultrasound into the picture at all. That's the point, right? I mean, this is, what was it, like a 20% negative, negative lap rate. That was the problem there that they were working against. But... Maybe we can solve that in other ways. So thankfully, the pediatricians uh, recognized that, hey, we can't CT every kid out there. So they came up with a protocol, and, and they published this protocol um, on using basically a combination of ultrasound or ultrasound first and then sort of a staged diagnostic al algorithm where they started with ultrasound, and then if that didn't work, then they watched the patients or they CT them. They enrolled 400 patients uh, into this ultrasound first protocol, and in 25% of them, they were actually able to diagnose appendicitis with ultrasound sound and uh, those patients dropped out of the rest of the algorithm and they, they went on to the operating room. They ended up with a 50% reduction in CT, which is which is pretty impressive. And then some of those patients who didn't have a positive ultrasound ended up going on and getting CT, or some of them uh, got in, got sort of monitored overnight and then taken based on physical exam or, or ruled out because they got better. In any case, the protocol itself had a sensitivity of 99%, a specificity of 91%. Pretty cool. Yeah, but it's important to note that's the sensitivity of the whole pathway, right? It's not ultrasound. Right, that's correct. So that would be everything together. They, they did pretty good. And tell me what's going on with this 50% reduction in CT when in your study, I remember it was like 13% or something. Well, I mean, so my study is only adults. We have a pediatric hospital right next to us. So Yeah, I think that's important to note that what you are doing is really new, and it's, it is tougher to ultrasound adults than peds. Thanks, Matt. You're welcome. So thankfully, Jim Sung has continued this research in the pediatric emergency department and uh, continued to advance the idea of ultrasound for appendicitis in pediatric patients. So they enrolled 150 patients in this study. Uh, and in this study, patients got an ED ultrasound or a radiology ultrasound or a CT scan uh, and went on to, uh, went, went on to get, uh, some of them obviously had their appendix taken out and some of them were found to be negative. So Jim got some uh, sensitivity specificity numbers for us. And uh, they found that uh, the sensitivity and specificity for uh, point of care ultrasound was six and 94% respectively. So that's pretty similar to stuff that we've seen in the past. Uh, for radiology ultrasound, it was slightly better, 62% uh, and 99% specific. And then for CT, this sort of blew my mind, so 83% sensitive, 98% specific. Yeah, these numbers are fascinating. I mean, we were just talking about sensitivity of CT being low 90s, mid 90s, but it's 83 in the study. It's pretty crazy. I think the thing that blew my mind the most, though, is when I looked at the experienced operator they talked about the people that had done this versus the novice. They put them all together. These are the numbers they had. But the experienced ED operators, sensitivity of 80%, specificity of 97%. That's closer to the CT rates than it is the radiology ultrasound. A much higher sensitivity and close to the same specificity. It's kind of crazy numbers, unexpected for me.
Yeah, this is great data. I'm, I'm glad to see this because this sort of proves something that I've always felt is that appendicitis ultrasound is extremely important that you have some experience doing it. You're going to get better at it as you do more of it. So it's just an argument for you, those of you out there who want to get better at, at ultrasound to make sure you practice this every time you order a CT on a patient for a suspected appendicitis. Yeah, as, as important it is to have an experienced operator as the final call, it's just as important to have the novice do it because you're not going to get to experienced operator if you don't practice as novice operator. You're not going to be an experienced. Uh, Very you lost concept. me. Very I'm sorry. You lost me. So if I want to be experienced, I got to get experience. Uh, close enough. All right. So we've got some pretty good data that appendicitis ultrasound works. So uh, why don't we just talk about how to do appendicitis ultrasound so everybody can get out there and practice it and become the expert. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to differentiate between the person on the left who has a normal abdomen, who has peristaltic bowel, and we can't find the appendix from the person on the right who has acute appendicitis. So what you're normally going to see is if you look at someone who doesn't have appendicitis, it's going to look something like the person on the left, assuming you can, and they don't have a retrocecal appendix or something bad like that. But then the person on the right, this is the really important thing. This is the thing that we want you guys to be able to pick up because it's the rule ends that'll pull the patient out of the diagnostic algorithm. It's the rule ends that prevents the CT. So this is what we're really looking for is to be able to diagnose acute appendicitis. So the appendix itself uh, comes off the cecal pouch. It attaches to the cecum pretty close to where the distal ilium attaches to the cecum. So sometimes we talk about finding the distal ilium or the cecal pouch to find the appendix, and that's the only reason that I bring up this anatomy. The appendix itself has got multiple different layers, and those layers often make it look like a bullseye on ultrasound. So you've got sort of a hyperechoic uh, serosa, you've got a hypoechoic uh, muscularis, a hyperechoic submucosa, a hypoechoic mucosa, and then a lumen that's usually hyperechoic. Now, don't get too set on this because as a patient develops appendicitis, the edema, the swelling, all the fluid that develops and the pus that develops inside of the appendix can often make those layers look totally different. So they'll get more hypoechoic, and what you end up up with is sort of a, an anechoic uh, looking pouch where it just looks like it's full of fluid. But in any case, if you find a normal appendix, it'll usually look kind of like this bullseye in short axis. So typically what I do, step one for finding a patient with acute appendicitis, is to ask the patient where they've got the most tenderness. And sometimes what I'll do is just give them the probe and say, I want you to put this on your belly wherever it feels the, feels the worst, wherever it feels the sharpest. And that'll usually be somewhere around McBurney's point. So it'll, it'll usually be in the right lower quadrant. And often what I'll see on the actual image is uh, something that looks kind of like this anatomic structure, structure here. As I push down, I'll bring the psoas up into the top of the screen, just like this. I'll see the rectus muscle over on the right of the screen, the external obliques on the left, and then typically, typically you'll see the iliac vessels over here on the right. So this is the area that I'm going to look around. I'm just going to sort of scan around, see if I see anything that looks like a blind-ended fluid-filled structure in that particular area where they say it hurts the most. About somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of the time, I would say that usually works, and that usually finds you the appendix. Uh, but sometimes you got to get a little more creative. So if that doesn't work, my next step would be to actually look for the iliac artery. So I'll sort of... That is a sweet prison tat. <laughs> this is a sweet, pretty prison tat, isn't it? <laughs> I totally get hep C for that. <laughs> So this is the patient's iliac artery. What I've done is I just sort of... Seriously, did you draw that on your fellow? Yes, with a permanent marker. <laughs> he said it took like a week to come off. Actually, we should, uh, we should offer, <laughs> as a part of your Castle Fest registration this year, we will draw a cecum and a <laughs> appendix on your abdomen. So you find the iliac, and then sometimes what you'll see is the appendix will be sort of draped over the iliac artery. So in this case, we're looking here at appendix, right, draped over the iliac artery, and then right on top of it would be the ilium kind of coming over, right? So this is a, a normal-looking appendix. You can see it's not dilated. It's not really fluid-filled. Uh, but in any case, that's one place you can sometimes find the appendix. And then finally... The last thing I'll try is I'll actually look for the cecal pouch. So you find the cecum here and you find this lumpy, bumpy gas pattern. And what we'll do is we'll just sort of track that gas down. So that's going to look something like this, where I'm sliding down the gas. And what I'm looking for is I'm looking for that area where the gas stops, which in this video would be right about here. So the gas stops. And you'll see the, the, the psoas start to come up into the bottom of the screen because the psoas sort of uh, runs from uh, posterior to more anterior as you get more inferior on the patient's abdomen. <laughs> what, so what? It runs superiorly oblique as you become more inferior posterior? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. <laughs> as you run from cranial to caudal, <laughs> the psoas runs from posterior to anterior. <laughs> <laughs>
in any case, you'll see this OS sort of, sort of come up into the top of the screen from below and the, right around the, the point of the, uh, the SQL pouch. It's in that area of the sort of the SQL pouch that we're going to actually find the appendix coming off of the cecum. So sometimes you can actually use the lumpy, bumpy gas pattern of the cecum to help you find the appendix. Again, these are our di do this? Again, these are, I'm, I'm showing it again because repetition, Dawson, you ever heard about it? This is our diagnostic criteria for acute appendicitis. So non-compressible, greater than six millimeters. If you use six millimeters, you might have a few false positives. If you use seven, you might miss a couple. So somewhere between six and seven millimeters is probably the, the money shot. Um, but there's also other things that we can find that can diagnose acute appendicitis, like the presence of a pinnacle lift can be suggestive or surrounding edema can be highly suggestive or a ring of fire. We'll talk about all those things in a bit. Here's a couple examples of acute appendicitis. So here in the top left, you've got a large fluid-filled blind-ended pouch and long axis measures around uh, one and a half centimeters with an appendicle lift in the very uh, tip of it. Then that same structure and short axis now measured here from outer wall to outer wall, 1.5 uh, centimeters definitely of acute appendicitis. Down here in the bottom right, same sort of structure. This one was full of uh, sort of this brown pus material that made it look like it had some material in the lumen. Uh, that one was acute appendicitis. And then here, the one in the bottom left shows us the ring of fire. So this is when we put power Doppler or color Doppler on the appendix. You actually see an increase in flow in the inflamed append uh, appendiceal wall. A couple of other nice tips when you're trying to make that diagnosis, say maybe the appendix is uh, 6.5 millimeters, and you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, I don't, I don't want to call it, overcall it, just because it's a little, a little over six, but it's not like a slam dunk acute appendicitis. Uh, other things can help you push you to make the di diagnosis, like the inflamed fat around the appendix here. So we often see this sort of fat straining around the appendix on ultrasound, where you actually get sort of edema of the of the fat around the appendix. But you can definitely have other things causing inflamed fat and pain down there. I just recently had a guy right little quadrant pain, really interesting case, tons of inflamed fat, but he had dilated bowel everywhere, right and left side, some thickened bowel wall, and he ended up being a new Crohn's diagnosis. So inflamed fat by itself isn't good enough, but combined, it, it can be pretty helpful. Other things you can look for are whether the appendix actually compresses or not. So acute appendicitis should be dilated and circular, should not be ovular, um, because it's full of pus, so it's stretching the walls, right? Uh, as opposed to a, an appendix that's rather, rather normal, it's easily compressible, or sometimes it's not circular because it's, uh, it's not distending the walls, it's not acutely infected. Then, of course, we can look for the uh, anechoic presence of fluid inside the actual lumen. So you can look to see if the actual hyperechoic walls of the, uh, of the lumen of the appendix um, uh, within the actual appendix itself, if they start to become anechoic, that's more suggestive of acute appendicitis than if you actually have those hyperechoic uh, uh, rims inside of the actual appendix itself. This is a patient who had uh, bad right lower quadrant abdominal pain for about three days, and then uh, a day before he came in, had sort of this brief period where it got better, and then it slowly progressed and got worse again. So this was an interesting patient who actually ended up having a uh, large uh, abscess right next to a, his appendix, and you can see it in this image here. You can actually see the abscess sort of walled off, and then you can see it connecting over here to where the appendix ruptured. Uh, so this guy, instead of going to the operating room, actually ended up a perk drain placed in his uh, abscess. All right, Matt, so let's do a little practice. So this is a patient with right lower quadrant pain who comes into your emergency department complaining of acute right lower quadrant pain, um, gradually uh, worsening over the day. Uh, and this is the point of maximal tenderness. You handed him the probe, and he put it right over this area, and, and this is what you see. So tell me, what do you think about this image? I want to clinically correlate that. Wait, actually, you already told me. Right lower quadrant pain, it sounds like appendicitis. Yeah, and it looks like appendicitis. All right, good. So well, that's that's one image. I'm going to give you another one, though. I don't want you to just call it on one image because we should always look at it in both planes, right? So this is another plane, and here you've measured it. I know it's kind of hard to see on the screen, but it measured at 0 0.74 centimeters. Yeah, that looks like an appendicitis as well. Good. So this is actually an image of your buddy who came in in the middle of the night while I was sleeping and uh, was complaining of right lower quadrant pain who you were texting with, and they were trying to get the consultant. I want to take, I want to take that all back because... You cheated. You didn't tell me that. <laughs> Dang it. It does look like an appendicitis. I know it does. Yeah. So uh, so this is why my resident thought he had appendicitis. Yeah, but he didn't check a urine yet. I mean, 
Fair, they're really tender in the right little fair form. enough. I kind of doubt it. Yeah, and have you you've you've seen so just the other day I had a guy come in with great exam for for um, peritonitis in the right lower quadrant, perfect exam for appendicitis. I did an ultrasound and I found this fluid filled one centimeter large structure and I was like, oh man, this guy's got appendicitis. So I went looking in long axis for the distal end of it and I ended up tracking it all the way back up to the kidney. So this guy ended up having a stone right at his UVJ and hydroureter that I found on ultrasound that looked a lot like appendicitis in short axis, but then I found it in long axis it was actually just as high, just as ureter. So you can get really impressive right lower quadrant pain from UVJ stones. And sometimes they get all the way down to the UVJ before they start causing pain. So you don't get that classic right flank pain to right uh, right lower quadrant uh, transition. All right, you got me. It's really painful to have the first mistake I've made in five years on the actual podcast, but uh, fair enough. Yeah, sorry, that was a little tricky. Yeah. All right, you know what I feel like we need? I feel like we need somebody smarter than us to teach us how to do appendicitis. I'd say let's get some Swedes. And I would like to say one last thing. I want to go ahead and apologize to Marcus in Brazil since we are 15 minutes late to meet him uh, because the cord fell out of the mic uh, for the second half of this, and we had to re-record it. If you think this was boring to listen to Mike do this once, imagine recording it with him twice. You know, we did a lot better than the three weeks that it took us to record the first appendicitis ultrasound podcast. That is true. Now let's get some Swedes. I always need me some Swedes. Hello, this is Jesper Dahlnilsson and Sono Sweden trying to teach you how to find the inflamed appendix. First of all, find the gas. The Schenden colon is almost without exception gas filled. And to find it and correctly identify it, start transfers with the probe marker to the patient's right. Start high up with great depth, which makes it more easy to pick up the gas shadow. Go lateral and find the gas. Here you see the probe sagittal subcostally. You see the gallbladder, you see the left liver lobe and the gas. Number two, follow the gas. In transverse planes, still with considerable depth to properly see the gas shadow, follow the gas caudally to the pole of the cecum where the gas shadow ends. This should be evident. Remember that some cecal poles are medially displaced and some very low in the pelvis minor. In most cases, though, the gas ends at McBurney's point. Here you see the most common anatomical variations with the appendix drawn out. Start high, find the gas, follow it down, look for the shadow, keep going down, keep going down, look at the gas, there it ends, go back up, identify it again, and then turn the transducer sagittal with the probe marker up. Reduce the depth. Keep the gas in sight. And there you have the position of the appendix. Now look for the obvious. The obvious is fat stranding, which is the surrounding edema. And by sweeping from side to side, you can also find a suspicious tubular structure in that area. Use patient-guided tenderness to localize the exact point of maximal pain. You can even ask the patient to put the probe where it hurts most. Like here in a normal case with no fat stranding and here, an obvious case with lots of white hypercoat fat stranding and a tubular structure. And again, another case, same thing, pathological fat stranding, big white hypercoat area, and a tubular black structure in the middle.
Switch to a high frequency transducer, typically 9 to 17 MHz, for more thorough exploration of the region. For obese patients, stay with the curvilinear or use the lower frequencies. Regarding presets, test this bowel or small parts are usually suitable. Vascular presets are often a bit too much contrast. Linear transducer, probe marker to the patient's head. Sweep from side to side, watch for the gas to the left. Look for the shadow. Zoom in, try to find the tubular structure. In this case, a normal appendix seen in the left of the image on top of the solus muscle. Try to identify the tip of the appendix and try to follow it all the way to the base. The tip nicely comes out here with some contents, some small bubbles of air. And this one is four to five millimeters in diameter. No fat stranding. Sequel pole is coming back to the left of the image. You see the alic vessels and the distal ilium is medial to the appendix with contents, motility, and a star-shaped center. You see the appendix below the ilium here. And now digging for the gold. Where you were sagittally, go back to find the sequel pole with the gas to the left of the screen. Marker still towards, towards the patient's head. And if you noted stranding or tubular structures, go straight for that. If not, you have to scrutinize the area more thoroughly. Sweep from side to side and try to find the appendix. If you find something suspicious, again, follow it to the base and follow it to the tip. Sweep medially to find the terminal ilium. The ilium has a typical shape and form with a star-shaped center. It has motility and contents. Sometimes you can see the valve and that might help you localizing the appendix originating typically a couple of centimeters caudally to that. And the base of the appendix is often tapered. The most common position of the appendix is a retrocycle, which makes it a bit more difficult. and You have to apply more pressure to find the appendix. Sometimes left lateral decubitus is good or a lateral approach. Now finally get the medal finding the inflamed appendix. Make sure you determine it's a blind ending structure with the tip. In this case the tip is to the left. You see the fat stranding, you see some fluid surrounding the, the appendix. Fluid collections can be seen and in this case you see some free fluids surrounding the appendix and to the left and to the right in the screen you see a normal ilium. Note the fat stranding, the hyperechoic area surrounding the appendix. Determining the diameter of the appendix, more than 6 millimeters. Grade the tenderness, is the patient tender over the appendix or somewhere else? Here's a nice example of fat stranding surrounding the inflamed appendix. You can also see some free fluid, hypervascularity, put on color doppler, Make sure you have the settings right so you get the low flow with low flow settings. And you should pick up flow in the inflamed appendix. You might find an appendicolith often situated at the base of the appendix. You can also see micro in the adjacent fat 
and also true abscesses often with a perforated appendix. Adenopathy is seen, but more common so with the terminal ileitis. In this case, you see large lymph nodes and a sick inflamed ileum to the right in the picture. Another example with the terminal ileitis, you see the thick mucosa, and below it you see a normal appendix lying on top of the psoas muscle. The normal appendix is a thin, non-tender structure with the ovoid shape in the cross section, no fat stranding, no pain, some content seen with gas or mucus. This is an example of a normal appendix. That's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasounds, hearts, lungs, my VCs. Let us know how you feel about it.